Okay, thank you, Eva. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we must keep our MDS patients adequately transfused because the probability of non-leukemic death, mainly from cardiac complications, rises steeply if male MDS patients have a hemoglobin of less than nine and female MDS patients have a hemoglobin of less than eight. Where is the pointer? There, okay. But chronic transfusion therapy causes iron overload. And iron overload, as measured by serum ferritin, has a dose-dependent impact, a negative impact, on overall survival in patients with lower-risk MDS. Of course, higher serum ferritin levels require higher transfusion need and therefore reflect more severe bone marrow disease. But even if on multivariate analysis, this transfusion burden is taken into account by including the number of red blood cell units transfused per month as a covariate, there's still a 30% greater risk of death evident for every 500 microgram per liter increase in serum ferritin above a threshold of 1,000. Similarly, data from the European Leukemia Net MDS registry show that besides transfusion burden, which is of course a major risk factor, increasing levels of serum ferritin also had an independent impact on overall survival in patients with lower risk MDS. I think the situation can be portrayed like this. Of course, transfusion burden is linked with shortened survival because it reflects severe bone marrow disease with all its possible detrimental complications. In addition, however, transfusion dependency causes iron overload, thereby creating a new medical problem, which has its own negative impact on overall survival. Within that conceptual framework, I think cardiac dysfunction has an important role, partly as a consequence of the detrimental effects of chronic anemia, partly as a consequence of cardiac comorbidity, and partly as a consequence of iron overload. And we should be aware that the heart is more vulnerable to iron toxicity than the liver, for instance. So cardiac function as measured by left ventricular ejection fraction, deteriorates as cardiac tissue iron concentration rises. And this gray-shaded danger zone starts at a cardiac tissue iron concentration of about two milligrams per gram dry weight of tissue. Such an iron concentration in the liver would not be considered particularly threatening because we know that liver iron concentrations above 15 are associated with the development of fibrosis and cirrhosis. So, clinically relevant cardiac dysfunction occurs at much lower tissue iron concentrations than clinically relevant liver dysfunction. <coughs> and this view is supported by this study and data obtained by studying 12 human hearts from transfusion-dependent patients after either death from heart failure or transplantation for end-stage heart failure. And the global myocardial iron causing severe heart failure in 10 patients was about six, with the danger zone starting at around three, which is similar to the previous slide. So this group of expert cardiologists and radiologists also concluded that the heart is more sensitive to iron loading than the liver. Today, I'm not going to delve any further into the problem of cardiac iron overload. Instead, I'd like to draw your attention to another iron-related problem that is perhaps underappreciated, namely iron-related endothelial dysfunction. This is not an entirely new novel topic, but one that has um, attracted renewed interest in, in recent years. For instance, um, Francesca Winke, working in Martina Muckenthaler's group in Heidelberg, is working in that field. And she recently uh, summarized her view as follows. With increasing age, high circulating iron levels strongly enhance the severity of the atherosclerotic phenotype, indicating that systemic iron overload is a risk factor for atherosclerosis progression and predisposes to cardiovascular disease. This diagram shows the hypothetical model. 
Macrophages in the vessel wall can accumulate iron from increased destruction of red blood cells or from deranged iron homeostasis under the influence of hepcidin. And when they accumulate iron, they also produce more reactive oxygen species. And interestingly, they have a lowered cholesterol efflux. The result is increased oxidative stress, cholesterol accumulation leading to the formation of foam cells and inflammation, and increased apoptosis, eventually leading to plaque destabilization. Now, could iron chelation perhaps have a positive, a beneficial influence under these circumstances? Fifteen years ago, it was shown that iron chelation improves endothelial function in patients with coronary artery disease. It was diferoximin that improved nitric oxide-mediated endothelium-dependent vasodilation in patients with coronary artery disease. And these results suggest that iron availability contributes to impaired nitric oxide action in atherosclerosis. And this paper in the British Journal of Hematology described the effects of deferazirox <coughs> on arterial function in patients with beta thalassemia major. And those patients who underwent 12 months of treatment with deferazirox showed a significantly improved brachial artery <coughs> flow-mediated dilation and a significantly decreased carotid arterial stiffness index, which was attributed to the ability of deferazirox to bind labile iron pools in the vascular wall, thereby diminishing reactive oxygen species formation and attenuating the nitric oxide inactivation. Now, these beneficial effects on the vasculature may actually be clinically relevant for our elderly MDS population who often suffer from vascular comorbidities. When we think about iron-related organ damage, we rarely consider that the bone marrow is another organ that may suffer from iron overload. But iron overload may actually aggravate the bone marrow dysfunction in MDS, thus setting up a vicious cycle. How might iron overload contribute to MDS pathology? Well, MDS is characterized by the emergence of a genomically unstable, dysplastic, and dysfunctional dominant clone, which together with its subclones interacts with an altered marrow stroma, which causes abnormal selection pressure, thereby favoring the outgrowth of maladapted clones with a propensity for further clonal evolution. Iron overload is well known to increase oxidative stress and therefore probably contributes to mutagenesis and clonal evolution. There's substantial evidence in the literature describing that oxidative stress is already increased in the bone marrow of patients with MDS and is aggravated by iron overload with detrimental effects on hematopoiesis. And part of the iron-related marrow toxicity may actually be due to genomic damage. And at der Hase's group in Göttingen evaluated the effects of iron overload on genomic instability in MDS by using uh, a battery of different tools uh, to assess chromosomal aberrations, point mutations, DNA damage, and telomere length. And they found in, uh, in, uh, significantly increased size of total genomic aberrations, a significantly decreased age-adapted telomere length in granular sites, and an increasing and a significantly increased of number of gamma H to X foci per peripheral blood CD34 plus cell. And the results support the assumption that iron overload might be causally related to genetic instability in patients with MDS. And the data also suggests that serum ferritin levels not only above 1,000, but also between the upper limit of normal and below 1,000 adversely affect genetic stability. Therefore, iron chelation might be relevant for patients with MDS at lower serum ferritin levels than previously thought. And Richard Wells' group in uh, Canada uh, found that uh, intracellular reactive oxygen species in CD34 plus cells correlates with serum ferritin in unchelated patients. And in vitro iron overload caused DNA double strand breaks similar to irradiation with 10 gray. Their conclusion was that iron is indeed mutagenic in hematopoietic cells through increased intracellular ROS, but they also stated that iron in, is not itself leukemogenic, because otherwise we would expect increased frequency of MDS and AML in patients with hereditary hemochromatosis or beta thalassemia major. 
However, in the context of the already existing genomic instability of the MDS clone, iron overload may promote clonal evolution. Iron overload may not only suppress hematopoietic progenitors, but may also damage the bone marrow stroma. Okabe and colleagues used a mouse model and found that bone marrow transplantation from normal donor mice to recipient mice with iron overload showed delayed hematopoietic reconstitution, indicating that excess iron negatively impacts the hemopoietic microenvironment. And um, mesenchymal stromal cells showed markedly reduced expression of surface molecules known to be involved in stem cell homing. And Zhang and colleagues also used the mouse model and found that iron overload impairs the proliferation of mouse bone marrow mesenchymal cells and free iron catalyzed the in vitro oxidative damage to mesenchymal cells, thereby attenuating hematopoiesis. Now, iron chelation appears to be able to ameliorate the detrimental effects of iron overload. Beneficial effects of iron chelation on oxidative stress in MDS has been documented in terms of decreased ROS production, decreased lipid peroxidation, improved colony growth, and decreased um, iron-mediated oxidative damage. It therefore appears plausible that iron chelation can improve hemotopoiesis in MDS. This table just shows the four largest studies on this topic. And looking at this column, you can see that the erythroid response rate ranged between 11 and 21%. And this effect is not restricted to Deferazirox. 20 years ago, uh, Peter Jensen and colleagues from Aarhus in Denmark reported on remarkable effects of deferoxamine on hemopoiesis in MDS patients with transfusional iron overload. I think the secret of success is maintaining adequate iron chelation over a long time. However, the mechanisms of improved erythropoiesis with deferoxamine are uh, being further investigated for instance, by Sophie Park's group in Grenoble. And they use a two-step erythroid differentiation system in liquid culture to assess the effect of iron and different chelator concentrations at day 5, 10, and 14 of erythroid differentiation. And they observed that low-dose deferazrox favors proliferation of erythroid progenitors. Low dose means deferazrox at a concentration of 3 micromolar, which corresponds to a low daily oral dose of 5 milligrams per kilogram. And proliferation of erythroid progenitors was increased because there were more cells in division and fewer apoptotic cells. And interestingly, these effects were not seen with deferazrox concentrations above 5 micromolar. And at 3 micromolar, deferazrox offered protection against mitochondrial ROS and reduction of lipid peroxidation. And it also caused increased nuclear translocation, which means activation, of NF-kappa-B. And gene expression analysis of 84 NF-kappa-B target genes showed five genes to be elevated more than twofold. And uh, in silico analysis uh, indicated that this uh, gene expression profile leads to an anti-apoptotic signal. And based on these data, there is a rationale for early introduction of ionculation therapy with low-dose deferazirox. And accordingly, a <coughs> clinical trial with low-dose uh, deferazirox is planned in France for patients with lower risk MDS, refractory to erythropoiesis stimulating agents, and the primary endpoint is transfusion independence at 12 months. I find this concept rather interesting. Now, I don't have the time to discuss all the potential benefits of ionculation in MDS, which may include improved outcome after allotransplantation. Instead, I'd like to briefly touch upon the question whether all those postulated benefits actually translate into improved overall survival. Tackling this question, we must be aware that in elderly MDS patients, the iron-related complications greatly overlap with common age-related problems. 
So even if the iron-related problems add up to a strong cumulative effect, this may easily hide behind those normal, common causes of death in the elderly. And that makes it so difficult to determine to what extent iron overload contributes to morbidity and mortality in MDS. Nevertheless, there are quite a number of retrospective analyses which consistently suggest that iron chelation may improve survival in transfusion-dependent MDS patients. The main problem with all those retrospective analyses on the impact of, on survival is that patient populations are usually well characterized regarding disease-related parameters and risk factors, but not characterized and certainly not stratified according to overall performance status. This introduces a possible bias because patients with a better overall performance status may be more likely to be started on iron chelation therapy, and this may, of course, have a significant effect on the Kaplan-Meier curves. This problem has been addressed by a study from the Canadian MDS registry, which meticulously documents patient performance status and comorbidities. And the Canadian colleagues were able to show that their iron and non-iron cohorts did not differ significantly regarding gender, performance scores, and comorbidity. And the survival difference between the iron and non chelated patient looks impressive. However, this study has a disadvantage because the cohorts were not equal regarding age. Patients with iron chelation were about two years younger and not equal regarding the IPSS risk group distribution. Age and IPSS risk group distribution were not a problem at all in the matched pair analysis from Düsseldorf. In this matched pair analysis, the cohorts were carefully matched for age, gender, MDS type, and MDS risk groups. And there was again a significant survival benefit of iron chelation. The disadvantage of this matched pair analysis was that the matching did not include performance score and comorbidity because of a lack of data. So this is a disadvantage that has to be kept in mind. However, if hematologists in Germany behave similar to their Canadian colleagues, we may assume that they did not restrict their iron chelation therapy to their fittest patients. And therefore, this potential bias may be negligible and the Düsseldorf data may, in fact, truly reflect the survival benefit of iron chelation in MDS, but we do not know for certain. I think the best data available so far are those from the European Leukemia Net MDS registry. At the last ASH meeting, this abstract was about the overall survival of 192 chelated patients, which was significantly better when compared with the large control group of 573 non-chelated patients even after adjustment for all relevant prognostic factors, namely age, sex, comorbidity, performance status, and number of red blood cell units transfused prior to start of chelation. And again, there was a significant survival benefit. Now I think a very important advantage, additional advantage of this study was that it looked at survival from the point in time when patients reached the eligibility criteria for, for, for iron chelation. Therefore, long-lasting stable intervals between diagnosis and onset of transfusion dependency were not counted and not misinterpreted as prolonged survival due to iron chelation. So I think short of a randomized prospective clinical trial, these data may come as close as possible to reflecting the true survival benefit of iron chelation in MDS. And iron chelation in MDS, last two slides, uh, has just become a bit more convenient with the new Defarazirox formulation, the once da daily film coated tablets. No preparation or mixing is required for pa and for patients who are unable to swallow a whole tablet, maybe crushed and sprinkled on soft food, maybe taken with a light meal, and it doesn't contain lactose and sodium lauryl sulfide. Due to higher bioavailability, the Defrazorix film coated tablet dose is about 30% lower than the dispersible tablet dose. And the Eclipse trial uh, directly compared both drug formulations. 
and a reduction in serum ferritin level was reported in all patients, and both formulations had a very similar safety profile. Also, the overall incidence of GI-related adverse events was similar with both treatments, but there were fewer severe GI adverse events in patients treated with the film-coated tablets. For instance, diarrhea was severe in patients receiving the dispersible tablets and severe in only 1.1% of the patients receiving the film-coated tablets. The patient-reported outcomes were a key component of the Eclipse study, including gastrointestinal tolerability diary, uh, uh, certain pal palatability scores, and several measures of overall satisfaction and preference. And to make a long story short, there was a clear preference in favor of the film-coated tablets in all domains. In my view, if this is an easier way to handle eye chelation, it may help to improve the adherence to the treatment and may thus help to make a survival benefit come true. And on that optimistic note, I'd like to close and thank you for your attention.